Well, whether you're worshiping here in the room or worshiping online, welcome to the City Tribe experience. And hey, how about this cooler weather? Anybody into sweater weather? Anybody into that right on? That's good times, isn't it? And so sweater weather means that we're getting close to the Christmas season, right? We're getting close to Christmas time, uh, starting to set up those trees and all of that. And in order to get into that Christmas spirit, uh, we want to be generous, don't we? And so that's why we're having our toy drive where we're going to benefit Cam Christians assistance ministries in order to help some kids that normally wouldn't be able to get some toys this year. And so basically you do three things. You can bring your toys to drop them off in the box when you come to church next week. If you're worshiping online, you'd like to do a drive-by and drop off your uh, toys here right out in front of the Cameo Theater on Commerce Street. There'll be a box where you can drop those donations in. Um, and so make sure and bring them next week. And then the third thing you do is you just pray. Pray for the family that's going to receive these toys uh, for, or these gifts rather, uh, for kids. Now, uh, when you bring those gifts, make sure and bring brand new toys. Don't just clean out, you know, those lame things that your kids slobbered all over or whatever, but bring something that's brand new. And as you look at the, the list of stuff on our website of to bring, uh, uh, we're targeting kids that are 11 to 18 year olds, okay? So uh, make sure and keep that in mind and you can go to our website for suggested gift ideas to see uh, uh, the best things to purchase for those toy gifts. Now, uh, Christmas Eve services, I wanna make sure I'm clear about how that's gonna go down this year. Every Christmas Eve, you know, we have all these services and you guys pile in and, and everything. But this year, the only ones that you can make reservations to come to are the 5 and 7 o'clock. So it'll be a 5 p.m., 7 p.m. service on Christmas Eve. We'll stream both those times. And you can come in person if you make a reservation for both those times. And then we'll only stream at the 11 p.m service. So uh, don't come to the Cameo at 11 p.m., uh, but you can stream it from your homes. And one of the special things about our Christmas Eve services is that we have baptisms, right? Uh, baptisms. And so if you believed in Jesus and you've not taken the first step of obedience in order to be baptized, that's something that you'll want to do this year. And some of you have waited long enough. You know, it's time. Baptism is kind of like this. It's kind of like uh, when Ladies, have you ever dated a guy and you're like officially dating, right? You're like boyfriend, girlfriend, official, and then he introduces you to someone at a party. It's like, eh, this is my lady friend. And ladies, you know how you feel about that, right? It's like, no, I'm not your lady friend. I'm your, I'm your girlfriend, right? Uh, the, uh, we're like official, okay? So don't be pulling that. And some of, you, some of you have believed in Jesus, but you're treating Jesus like your lady friend. Jesus is not your homeboy. He's not your lady friend. He's your Lord. And when he's your Lord, you obey him, see? And so the first step of obedience when we begin to follow Jesus is to be baptized. Make sure you get signed up at citytribe.church slash baptism. Now, for our teaching today, I've invited one of my friends to come and teach us today in our Emotional Gauges series regarding relationships. And this friend is pastor at Metanoia Church right here in San Antonio. His name is Jubal Garcia. And we got to be friends just in recent years. And it was an immediate connection, what I call kinship, where we just relate. I love him because he has a heart for Jesus, like re a real sincere heart for the Lord he loves the church. He loves our church. And you'll see that. And we enjoy hanging out together. You know, we'll go on uh, bike rides or we'll go eat really good food and enjoy our time together. Sometimes we like to go to this place, Manganato King, great, like uh, little drinks there. In fact, we're thinking about getting matching sweaters and a tandem bike, you know, but uh, would you guys online, if you're watching online, give some love in the comments. And those of you that are in the room, would you give a rowdy and warm City Tribe welcome to my dear friend, Jubal Garcia. Good morning. Oh, man, I love your church. If I didn't have a church, I'd go to this church. But I do have a church, so they will hang me. Your, your pastors are amazing. I love your pastors. All of them, specifically El Jefe over here uh, and Jeannie. I, I love them dearly. I love their family. And, and he's, he's right. We are... 
We're like the white Mexican version of Step Brothers. Um, that's just us. Um, but I love your your church. I love your worship team. Your 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 production team. Your church is just amazing. I always tell people, if Metanoia isn't your cup of tea, go to City Tribe. That's always just it's just my next place. So uh, I I don't I don't know a lot of you, but I love you guys and I pray for you and our church and our team pray for you all the time. Um, so they gave me uh, a session today with you guys. I'm really excited. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but I have a lot to cover, so we got to jump right on it. Um, but before we, we start, I'd like to pray with you and ask the Lord to just uh, help us uh, not only just learn stuff, but to get it into our spirit, right? We don't just want head knowledge. We want it to get into our spirit. So just right there where you're at, will you pray with me? Lord, uh, thank you for this opportunity we have with uh, our City Tribe family. Thank you that I have the privilege and the honor to be with them today. Uh, we thank you for this church and this team um, and everything they're doing, not only for this city, but for the world. Um, today, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would be with us and that you would just illuminate our soul today. God, as we unpack everything you want to teach us, I pray that it would go beyond our head and into our heart. Lord, your word says that you don't want us to be just hearers of the word. You want us to be doers of the word. And so today, we make a conscious decision to be doers of your word. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. So, um, you guys are on a series on check your emotional gauges. And today, we're going to talk about relationships, okay, and, and, how, uh, and about relational peace. So... Um, I want to tell you a quick story, and then we'll jump right in it. So there, I, heard, I read a story years ago about this beautiful woman who was invited uh, to this fundraiser in New York, right? So she goes to this fundraiser, and the table that she's sitting at is with a lot of prestigious people. One in particular happens to be this very prominent lawyer. And so she uh, sits with them. They're having drinks. They're having a good time, enjoying each other's company. And halfway through the night, the lawyer leans over and and whispers in her ear and tells, asks her if she would spend the night with him for $10,000. She kind of chuckles and laughs and kind of blushes and then says, well, I, I guess so. And as the night continues, they're, they're having a few more drinks and enjoying their fellowship. And he leans over and he says, well, would you go to bed with me for $1,000? She looks back and she says, what kind of woman do you think I am? And he looks at her and he says, sweetheart, we already know. Now we're just negotiating price. And I think about that because there are a lot of things in life that are negotiating with us for our peace. Everything in life that happens, every situation, every circumstance, every situation, every problem, every good thing, people, friends, family, are constantly negotiating with whether or not we're going to have peace or whether peace is going to be taken away. And you are in constant negotiations. Even right now as we sit here, there are negotiations for your peace. Some of you are going, man, did I turn the, 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 the curling iron off? Did I, did I leave the oven on. Did it, something's negotiating for your peace right now. Is this guy going to take longer than he should? But something is negotiating for your peace. And it's important that you understand that, that constantly, every single day, every scenario, every situation, your spiritual well-being and your emotional peace is at stake. And people and situations are fighting for it. You know, there's people in your life that are either going to bring you peace or they're going to take peace from you. And that's happening constantly. And sometimes they're friends and sometimes they're family and sometimes they're romantic relationships. But everything, every day is battling for your peace. I would know that because in the last few years, I've had a, a lot of loss in my life. I lost my father to a congestive heart failure. Which was interesting because it was really painful. My father wasn't only my father, he was my best friend. And he wasn't only my best friend, he was my hero. He wasn't only my hero, he was the person who led me to the Lord. And he wasn't only the person that led me to the Lord, he was the person who gave me an opportunity and taught me about ministry. And so when I lost him, I lost about five people. 
And that was heartbreaking for me. A few years after that, went through a painful, painful divorce. Recently, I just went through a, a family division with siblings. Just painful scenarios that people go through that life brings you. And some of them you have control over and some of them you don't. And you've got to ask yourself, am I going to allow these things to bring peace or take peace from me? And then I'm guilty, right, of blaming other things. Well, the reason why I'm not at peace is because of them and because of her and because he did this and they said that and they did that. But I want to submit to you something today. I want to submit to you that you're responsible for your own peace. And I also want to submit to you something else, that you don't have to negotiate with your peace. And so I know every week you guys have a transforming declaration. Here's the transforming declaration for today. Ready? My peace is not negotiable. My peace is not negotiable. You're going to have to make a decision that you're not going to give people power whether or not you're going to live in peace. It's a decision you have to make. Now, you might go, well, how did I do that? Well, because God has given you what's called a free will. Actually, the term, the theological term for that is volition. It means you have the power to choose. And so you and I are responsible for our own peace. And so as we're talking about relationships today, I, I, I want to start with a question today. Are relationships important? That's the question. Are relationships important? Yes. The answer is yes. You know that relationships existed before human beings existed. Think about that. Relationships existed before human beings existed. The Bible talks about how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were in community before the creation of the world. So a relationship already existed. Then humans come along and God says, let's make them in our image. Part of the human DNA that comes from God is the need for relationships, the desire for relationships. That's, that's why breakups are so bad. You know, when you break up and it's painful. That's why family estrangements are so bad. That's why they hurt so much. That's, that's why, think about this, even in the prison system, when somebody's locked up and they do really, they even do bad in there, you know what they do? They put them in isolation. Think about that. They put them, the, one of the worst punishments you can do to someone in prison is put them in isolation. Put them alone isolate them from relationships and from community is you know that a lot of people that are locked up in isolation go crazy they go crazy because we're built it's in our dna to want relationships so remember the transforming declaration today my peace is not negotiable we're going to talk about two different kinds of relationships today friendships and family okay friendships and family let's start with friendships okay let me give you some few things on friendships number one Healthy, let's start with healthy friendships. Healthy friendships encourage and build you up. That's part of having a healthy friendship. So start doing some inventory right now about your friendships, right? Because healthy friendships encourage and build you up, okay? Two things, they encourage you and they build you up. Scripture says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So continue encouraging one another, there it is, and building each other up just like you're already doing. There's two things that are important about a healthy friendship. It encourages you and it builds you up. Now, when we say encouraging, we're not just talking about saying yes to everything you do, right? Encouraging, like just say yes, just agree with me. No, because sometimes encouragement comes in the form of confrontation. Sometimes encouragement comes in the form of going, hey, you know what? I know I'm your friend and I know you're upset, but you were wrong in what you told that person. And I, I need to encourage you to go ask for forgiveness. Like I'm gonna really strongly encourage you. And that's huge because sometimes we think of his encouragement as just agree with everything because you're my friend. And, fr and real encouragement, real encouragement, godly encouragement sometimes includes confrontation where it says, you know what? I love you. You're my friend. We're going to be friends after this. But what you did was wrong. That wasn't good. And so we've got to make sure that our friendships are always encouraging us and building us up. Here's another one. Healthy friendships yield high interest. Healthy friendships yield, yield high interest. In other words, when you have a good, healthy friendship, your return on investment is going to be high. It's going to be healthy. And, and then look at in Ecclesiastes 4.9, it says this. Two people are better than one because together they have good reward for their hard work. 
In other words, when you have two people that work hard, and we can put this in the context of friendship, it's going to return healthy rewards. And I can say that about your pastor. You know that your, my friendship with your pastor has yielded high rewards for me. I don't know about him. Maybe he hasn't gotten as high as return because of me, but I know I've gotten a good return on investment with, with your pastor. And in my friendship with him, we, we laughed, we've cried. He's called me out on certain things. He's challenged me on certain things. And I can look back at my friendship with him and, and, say, and testify and say, you know what? My friendship with your pastor has yielded high interest in my life. It's been good for me. I'm a better man because of my friendship with him. And that's the kind of friendship you got to look for. You got to make sure that your friendships are bringing back a healthy return on investment. Here, here's another thing. Healthy friendships help you in times of trouble. Healthy friendships help you in times of trouble. Now, let me say something very clearly. It doesn't say friendships should get you in trouble. Okay, because some of us have friendships that get us in trouble. Now, healthy friendships help you in times of trouble. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says this. If one falls, the other pulls him up. But if a man falls when he's alone, he's in trouble. And so you've got to make sure that the friendships that you're watering and the friendships that you're nurturing don't get you in trouble but help you in times of trouble. So we're talking about healthy friendships, right? But obviously if there's healthy friendships and there's also toxic friendships, right? And, and so it's important that we as followers of Jesus learn to discern which friendships are healthy and which friendships are toxic. Because the healthy ones you've got to pull to, the toxic ones you've got to pull away from. But okay, so that... It, we say we've got to learn to discern between healthy friendships and toxic friendships. The word discern, what does that mean? Discernment is simple. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of like a churchy word, discern. You've got to be discerning. But it's, all it means is you've got to be, able to, to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit when he speaks to you and goes, this one probably isn't good for you. Right? The, the cultural word that we use for it is not discernment. You know what the cultural word is? Vibe. You know what, I met this guy, man, I just got this vibe. It just wasn't good. Well, that's technically biblically discernment. We use different words. It's the, vibe is the millennial term for discernment, okay? The biblical term is discernment. Just to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit when he says, not this one. This is not good. And they may not be bad people. They're just not good for you. And, and that's the important thing. Healthy friendships, toxic friendships... How do I discern that? Why is it important to be able to discern the toxic friendships? Because 1 Corinthians 15 says this, don't be fooled, bad friends will ruin good habits. When the scripture says, there's a power of influence that toxic people have on us. Now, you may go, yeah, I've heard that somewhere. You have heard it from where, somewhere, especially if you're Mexican. We've heard that verse all our lives growing up. We just didn't know it was the Apostle Paul. All of our grandmas and abuelitas always said, Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. I hate to break it to you, but your grandmother didn't invent that phrase. The Apostle Paul invented that phrase. In English, they say it a different way. They say, tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you where you're going. What is this talking about? The power of influence, right? And this is why it's so important to be able to discern healthy and toxic. Because who you associate with gives direction to your life. And so let me give you some, some, some encouragement on some unhealthy friendships, okay? First of all, get rid of toxic friendships. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Well, how do you define a toxic friendship? Well, narcissistic. People that are in love with themselves. Get rid of people like that in your life. Okay? What do we mean by that? These are people that hoard the conversation. You ever had a friend that all they did was just control the whole conversation? You couldn't get a word in. You couldn't say anything. Right? Or they're, they're conversation interrupters. You, start, you finally get a break in the conversation. And you're like, oh, yeah, by the way. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Let me say. It's like. 
These are people that violate boundaries. You tell them what your boundaries are and they don't respect them. They still cross the line. They still do what you ask them to do. You ever met people like that? Well, why haven't you? I I was looking for you all day. Why haven't you answered me? I called you 27 times. You're like, first of all, I just met you yesterday. (laughs) Right? That's a sign of a toxic friendship. Entitlement. They think that they deserve or that you owe them things. Uh, False image. You can never win in the relationship. If you had a good day at work, they had a better day at work. If you got a promotion, they've had that promotion before. If you got a bonus, they've made more on their bonus. They're always pushing out a false image that they're better than you. You got to be able to get rid of people like that. You want to put it in simple terms? Drama. Just get rid of that. You got to get rid of the, why? Why is that important? Proverbs 18 tells us, destructive people produce conflict. If if you have friendships that are are conflicting in your soul, it's going to cause destruction in your life. And remember the transforming declaration, my peace is not negotiable. I'd rather get rid of someone toxic and keep my peace than to lose my peace and keep someone toxic. Here's another word of encouragement for friendships. Set boundaries in your friendships. Set boundaries. Put some boundaries there. Say, look, these are just lines nobody crosses with me. These are things that I just don't allow. It's just the way I am. Matthew 5 says it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. There's nothing wrong with boundaries. There's nothing wrong with telling people, I don't allow people to cross these lines with me. And don't fall into the trap. I just don't want to hurt them. Hey, feel free to hurt them as long as they're your boundaries. Well, it hurts me that I can't call you 27 times. It's just, you're just going to have to deal with that hurt. Because I don't allow these things. There, there's certain things I don't allow. You've got to be able to build boundaries in friendships. The fact that someone doesn't want a boundary tells you that they're toxic. Because genuine friendship will respect your boundaries. Genuine friendships will support your boundaries because they understand that that's healthy for you. Be careful, set boundaries, and be very careful also about people that always talk about other people. You ever had friends like that? That every time you sit with them, all they do is talk bad about people? Oh, guess what about this girl at work? Remember that girl at work I told you about? Oh my God, guess what she did today? Oh, guess what happened? I went to, get rid of people like that. You don't need people like that in your life. Look, Leviticus says it this way. You must not go around spreading false stories against other people. Simple. Just get away from toxic conversation. And let me give you another word of encouragement, okay? Some of you are struggling, maybe emotionally, you're going through some depression or or some stress in your life, and sometimes it has to do with the people you're associating with. Sometimes the friends you have are the ones that are putting all that pressure on you. So here's the word of encouragement, okay? Before you diagnose yourself with depression or low self-esteem, Just make sure you're not surrounded by toxic people. It may be all that, those toxic friendships around you that are causing all that stress. You know that that I started doing some inventory about a year and a half ago, and just by cutting out certain people, my peace began to increase. I didn't do anything different. Like, I didn't go, like, gluten-free or, or I didn't, like, low, lower my carb intake. It was just, like, you know, it wasn't like that. There was, you know, didn't purchase alkaline water. And it was like, wow, I feel great. I just cut certain people off. And just that move right there was like, I could breathe again. And so it's so important that you realize that. Here's one more thing. Uh, Find a godly mentor. Find a godly mentor. Find, in other words, find a godly coach. Someone that'll help you walk this journey. Someone that'll encourage you. Someone that'll build you up. Someone that'll coach you on your walk with Jesus. Let me tell you why this is important. Did you know that humans, think about this. Humans can't walk a straight line without a point of reference. If you and I don't have a point of reference, we can't walk a straight line. As a matter of fact, if you blindfold a human being, studies show that at some point they'll just start walking in circles without knowing it. Now think about this. If we can't walk a straight line physically without help, then imagine how, what kind of line we're going to walk if we don't have any spiritual help. Maybe that's why mentors are so important because some of us feel like we've been walking in circles in our walk with Jesus 
And here's the reason why. You don't have any point of reference. You don't have anyone to coach you, anyone to encourage you, anyone to show you the way. That's why mentors are so important. Let me tell you a really cool, really cool statement that I heard from Pastor Darius Daniel say. He said this. He said, mentors allow you to go to school at the expense of someone else's tuition. Think about that. Mentors allow you to go to school at the expense of someone else's tuition. You know what mentors do? They let you glean off their experience. They can tell you which way not to go because they've been there before. My father used to say it this way. Son, a wise man will learn from his mistakes. A wiser man will learn from someone else's mistakes. Right? That's what mentorship does. Right? That's what men, I heard a story one time about a young man who walked into a, a, a hotel restaurant and he saw uh, one, of his, one of his heroes, which was a famous businessman, eating in the restaurant. And he, he snuck in there and he said, man, I got to make my way just to say hi to him. And so he snuck his way through the tables and this businessman was having a luncheon and he, he, he got to the side of the table and he was like, hey, I just want to meet you. My name's so-and-so. You're my hero. I look up to you. I've read all your books. He said, can I, just, can I just ask you one question? And the old man said, yeah, of course. He said, how can I be as successful like you? And the older man said, you got to have experience. And the young man said, oh, well, how do I gain experience? And the older man says, you got to make good decisions. And the young man said, well, how do I learn to make good decisions? And the older man said, got to make bad decisions. That's what mentorship does. It allows you to learn at the expense of someone else's experience. And this is why it's so important to have a mentor. Proverbs 17 says it this way, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for times of adversity. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for times of adversity. You know, I have a text message saved, a screenshot from your pastor. And when I was going through a tough season about a year and a half ago, and I was just heartbroken and going through a heavy storm and devastated, I took a break. I took a sabbatical from ministry, and I said, I just need time to heal. And I have a screenshot from your pastor. And you know what he said? He sent me a message one day, just randomly, and he said, hey, man. I just want to tell you that I love you and that I'm here for you. And even if you never do ministry again, you have a friend in me. And I thought to myself, a brother is born for times of adversity. That's it. In my time in adversity, I had someone who was there for me, who fed my soul. This is why mentorship is so important. And let me tell you what's cool about mentorship, okay? You guys have a tribe coming up soon that's about to start. On December 8th, this is a Tuesday, remember this, on December 8th, if you've ever gone through any kind of loss, and I'm talking about breakups or death or, 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 or divorce or any kind of loss in your life, any kind, maybe a strange family relationships because of, uh, of conflict, you guys are starting a new tribe on December 8th. And it's for loss. It's a support tribe for bereavement and loss. And I want to encourage you, if you felt any kind of loss, join this tribe, man. Go to the City Tribe website. Talk to Joe, uh, uh, Brother Joe. And, and, and if you're online and you're watching right now, go to the website. Sign up. This is why. Let me tell you something, okay? I know that churches do all kinds of groups and small groups and stuff. But this church does it excellently. I love the way you guys love people and the way your leaders love people. As a matter of fact, full disclosure, my church steals a lot of stuff from your church. <laughs> when your pastor goes and preaches at my church, he goes, oh my God, I feel like, it feels like city church. I'm like, yeah, because we stole a lot of stuff from y'all. <laughs> I love the way you guys do it. And here, look, 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 you're here, you're part of the City Tribe family. You don't have to go far. On December 8th, just a couple of weeks, a, a little over a week, you have a tribe starting. So go to the City Tribe website, sign up and go, hey, I want to be a part of that. I've had some kind of loss, a friendship, a breakup, a death in the family, an estranged family member, something in my family. Why? Why is it so important? Because what's the transformational 
thought. My peace is not negotiable. If for no other reason, do it for your own peace. But join the tribe. Uh, Joe's ready to lead that. It's going to be a great tribe. I, I might join it, so you might see me there too. Okay, let, let, let's close this up because I, I've got uh, 22 seconds left. Okay, family relationships, okay? Family relationships. This is interesting. Family relationships are interesting because it could be loving or it could be World War III. Right? You can all be having a wonderful time at Thanksgiving last week or I never want to see you again. Right? And especially, I don't know how, anybody online, don't get offended. I don't know how white people do it or black people do it or Asian people do it. But Mexicanos, (laughs) if you're Mexican, all of us, and you may not want to say amen or raise your hand, but your laughter is an amen, another form of amen. All of us, if you're Mexican, all of us have somebody in our family that we don't talk to. All of us. And most of us don't even know why we don't talk to them. It's just generationally we don't talk to them, right? When you go to the family, no les hables, no les hables a ellos. <laughs> Grandma White, tú no más no les hables. Okay. Sorry, I can't talk to you. <laughs> like, why do we not talk to that cousin? Because we don't, we just don't talk to them. Let me say something about families, okay, real quick. For those of you that are trying to like raise the best family you can, and I, I, I applaud you, and you're just, you know, I don't want my family to be like how I grew up, and I want my kids. Let me give you just some encouragement. All families are dysfunctional. I, I understand. You're reading James Dobson books, and you know, you're reading all these. I get it. I understand. And you should and keep getting better. I'm working on that as a father. But all families are dysfunctional. I can prove it to you. Romans 3.23 says this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what that means? We're all sinners. And as long as everybody in your family are sinners, there's gonna be conflict. That's just life. You know, that, fr- that verse is important because we use it, as preachers, we use that verse a lot. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And sometimes it confuses people because it says, we fall short of the glory of God. That phrase, glory of God, that's important because sometimes we think of the glory of God and we go, what is glor- the glo- what's the glory of God? You know, you hear people go, I can sense the glory of God. And you're like, where is it, right? Like, and I used to freak out when they used to say that. They're like, the glory of God is here. And I was like, where? <laughs> but... I was a weird kid. But, <laughs> but the glory of God is simple. It's not light or smoke. The glory of God means everything that encapsulates God. Everything God, the fullness of God as we can know him as humans. But the fullness of who God is, which means the glory of God includes his love and his mercy and his grace and his kindness and his forgiveness. All of that that embodies God, that's his glory. His presence, his long suffering, his goodness, everything that embodies God is his glory. Watch. So when Jesus walked the earth, he was the embodiment of who God is. Jesus was the full expression of God. That's why when the disciples looked at him and said, can you do me a favor? Can you show us who God is? He looked at him and he said, he said, man, I've been walking with you for three years and you don't get it, do you? And then he said this, he said, Don't you know that anyone who has seen me has seen the Father? What he was saying was, everything you want to know about God, that's me. I've I've embodied it. So Jesus is the glory of God. You want to know how God loves? Look at Jesus. You want to know how God treats his family? Look at Jesus. How, How God talks? Read the Gospels. You want to know how God treats his enemies? Look at Jesus in the Gospels. You want to know how he reacts to a slander and, and, and betrayal and ridicule and mistreatment? Look at the Gospels. Everything you see Jesus do is the full embodiment of who God is. So when we say we all fall short of the glory of God and Jesus is the fullness of the glory of God, you can actually say for all have sinned and fall short of being like Jesus. We all fall short of being like Jesus. So as long as we're all going to fall short of being like Jesus, families are going to be imperfect. It's part of life. I come from a family that we weren't always Christians, but the Lord saved us, thank God, and, and we did ministry together, and thank God for that, but we were still dysfunctional. 
We still had problems. We still have family divisions, family breakups, family arguments. It's part of life because we're all sinners. So here's a few things real quick and we close. Learn to forgive. Learn to forgive. You just got to learn to forgive. I can't. Well, learn. Got to learn to forgive. Look, let me tell you something, okay? I tell people all the time, I've got to learn. I have had to learn to forgive really quickly in my family. When I have family disagreements, I got I to gotta forgive. You know why I got to forgive? Not because I'm really spiritual. Here's why. I can go from, my temper can go from zero to life in prison really quick. <laughs> so it's for my benefit and theirs that I forgive quickly. I thought I was going to give you some spiritual thing like Doug, right? Like the Bible says, no, nah, mine's ghetto. I, I don't want to go to prison. So I'm just going to forgive. Okay, so watch. Here's what the scripture says, Colossians 3.13. Don't be angry with each other, but forgive each other. If you feel someone is wronged, you forgive them. Forgive others because the Lord forgave you. And, and when it says don't be angry with each other, I don't think it means like don't get upset because there's another verse that says be angry and don't sin. So the Bible is okay with us getting angry. What I think it's implying here is don't stay angry. Don't let that anger turn into bitterness. Don't let that bitterness turn into hate. Don't let it get poison and toxic in your soul. Forgive. And so it's important that you learn to forgive. I'm going to close with this today, okay? Because we've talked about two kinds of relationships, friendships and family relationships. Let me say this. There was a, 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 a and it's, it's interesting that we're talking about this in a theater, but there was a famous Broadway actor and he would do these incredible monologues on stage and he would blow people away. And people, every night was a sold out show, right? Seven days a week, two matinees on Saturday, two matinees on Sunday, sold out for years. And he would do these one man monologues and blow people away. But the most amazing part of the show was that when he finished his monologue, he would come back on stage and he would stand in the middle of the stage and he would do the 23rd Psalm. And he would quote the entire 23rd Psalm and the audience would wait for him to quote it. And when he would quote it, they would stand up, stand in ovation. They were just blown away by how he, how he, how he uh, vocalized it. And so this one day, it was interesting, he finishes his monologue. He comes back to the center of the stage. He's about to give the, the 23rd Psalm and a hand is raised on the second row. And he says, yeah, can I help you? And it's this 13-year-old little boy. And he says, sir... I know you're about to do your Psalm 23rd uh, monologue, but can I do it tonight? And he was blown away, but he was, you know, shocked. He's like, yeah, come on stage, come on. And they brought him on stage. They brought the little boy on stage, and he comes on stage, and he says, uh, can, can I do it? And he goes, yeah, go ahead. So the, the man, the actor, stands to the, to the side of the little boy, and the little boy, audience gets quiet, and the little boy, in a soft voice, begins the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And as soon as he started, the presence of God filled the room. People began to cry. They had no idea what was happening. But men and women and adults and young people and elderly people, without making any reactions, just tears began to flow from their eyes. And everybody in the room was in tears and the little boy begins to close and he says and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever everyone was in tears and the actor also in tears goes and embraces the little boy and says I've never experienced what just happened right now he says I, 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 what happened what just happened everybody everybody's quiet and the actor said, I've done this every night for years and I've never gotten this reaction. What happened? And the little 13 year old boy looked at him and said, well, sir, here's the difference. He said, you know the Psalm, but I know the shepherd. And that's what I'm trying to get to today. If you want to have any healthy relationship with any person, it all starts by having a healthy relationship with God. That's where it starts. That's the starting point 
for a healthy relationship. You want a re healthy relationship with your friends? It starts with a healthy relationship with God. You want a healthy relationship with your family? It starts with your healthy relationship with God. And so today as we close, for those of you that are here, and thank you for your time, and those of you watching online, I want to say this. I just want to, I want to end today by giving any one of you or all of you, whether you've done it or not, to start today having a healthy relationship with God. Because nothing else matters if you don't start there. The best healthy relationship to begin with is with God. From there, everything else comes next. And so at my church at Metanoia, we say it's as easy as ABC. Really simple. ABC. Remember those letters. A, all you have to do is admit. Admit that you're a sinner and that you don't have it all together. Or maybe you admit it and go, you know what? Actually, my life is pretty good. But you can admit that in your soul, there's something missing. You know, deep down inside, man, there's something that, there's a void there. Just admit it. That's all you have to do. B is believe. Believe that God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for your sins. That he took your place. That his blood on the cross paid your sin debt. And that he rose from the dead to give you a brand new life. That's B. And C, just confess. Confess him as Lord. Just say, Lord, you know what? I'm going to trust you today. I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to start my first healthy relationship I'm going to start with is going to be with you. And I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to give you my life right now. So A, B, and C. A, admit. B, believe. C, confess. And so right now, as we close, I want to pray with you. I'd like you to pray with me right now. If you're online and you want to pray with us, just whatever you're doing, just pray with us right now. Would you just pray with me right now and say this? Just repeat after me. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on a cross, you took my sin, my shame, my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so that I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. And would you, all of you right now just confess this out loud with me? If you're online, just confess this next statement out loud with me. Say this. Say, God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. City Tribe, I love you guys. Hey, man, anybody in this room or online get blessed today by hearing Pastor Jubal share with us? Wasn't that fantastic? Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I love about Jubal is he's one of the most generous people I've ever met. And we're trying to build that, right? Uh, like Paul says, growing this grace of giving. We want to be a generous people. That's why we're doing the toy drive this year. That's why we had set up our benevolence fund. We're paying bills for people who are struggling financially during the crisis. And so um, this is also why we regularly teach what the Bible teaches. And that is we regularly bring a first fruit tithe at the local storehouse the church. We want to be a generous people. And this last week, I got an email that I'll not soon forget. And I want to read it to you just really quickly. It's from a dear sister in our church that struggled with her health. She struggled financially, been somewhat food insecure. And another sister in our church wanted to hook her and her family up for Thanksgiving. And she talks about the sister from our church who helped her out. And she says this. She says, Thank you for this woman who blessed my family with a wonderful, delicious Thanksgiving meal that we would not have otherwise been able to have. She and her family were so kind and thoughtful. She went beyond the food, and she supplied us with decorations and utensils. The food was delicious, and we have leftovers. Thank you, Jesus. And so our generosity is beyond the food, isn't it? And it's beyond the tithe or the offering above and beyond the tithe. We give it with love. See, that's the difference. And that's what she experienced. And that gift was given with love. That's why it was multiplied. And she had not only had enough for herself, she had enough for her family. 
13 of them, and she had leftovers because God is the God of more than enough, isn't he? And so that's the heart we want to have as we go to bring our first fruit tithe here at the local storehouse. Here's how to get that done at City Tribe if you're new with us. There are actually four ways to do it now. Um, regularly, you can donate you know, by mail. You can send in your offerings to uh, the P.O. box that you'll see on our website or on uh, if you're watching online, you can see it on screen right now. You can also donate online. You can text to Tribe. Just text the number on screen, 74483. You text the word Tribe, space the dollar amount, and press send. Um, in addition to that, if you're here in the theater today, you can drop by the giving boxes. One's located in the lobby, one's here uh, to my left, your right on the door on your way out. So before you guys worship through your financial stewardship, if you're in the theater, stand with me real quick. If you're at home, you can stand as well. If you're at home, you can just kind of reach out a hand like this. If you're in the theater, you can reach out a hand. If you're next to your family members, you can put your arm around them. Don't touch anybody else, though. You know, the Rona's going around, so be careful. Uh, but anyways, uh, put your arms around and, and receive these words of benediction over you. Dear brothers and sisters, as you walk from this place, may you walk from here blessed in all your relationships. Because, see, your peace is not negotiable, brothers and sisters. You're going to walk from here in peace with your family, at peace with your spouse, at peace with your kids and all your friendships. But most of all, you're going to walk from here at peace with our good God who loves you so much. You guys have an amazing week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys.